Good morning and thanks for joining us on The Real Story. I'm Jen Bernstein. Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro has been in her seat for more than 30 years, but this year is going to be different for her. Fresh off of her win in the 3rd District, she is celebrating another victory, being voted by her Democratic colleagues into a powerful position, chairing the House Appropriations Committee. It's a big job, the Appropriations Committee tasked with appropriating or allocating funding. I recently spoke with her about this new role and what it may mean for Connecticut. Here's part of our conversation. Congresswoman, congratulations on your post. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really, very honored and delighted and very excited about this opportunity. Yeah, this is an incredibly powerful position. Um, I was talking to Congressman Joe Courtney about this yesterday, I interviewed him for The Real Story, and he was talking about how I think he was looking back on when someone from Connecticut, I don't think anyone from Connecticut's ever held no. this post, correct? No, no one from Connecticut has, that's right. That's right. Ever. So, no, it's the first, and I will be the second woman to hold the post. My, con my colleague, Congresswoman Nita Lowy from New York, held it before me. But for, the, for Connecticut, you know, this is, uh, this is a first. And you're going to have a little bit of a different go than your predecessor because you're going to be working with a Democratic president. How is that going to change things? Well, I think that that really is a, it's a very, very good uh, you know, a, a point because I, I think that, and we are on the similar wavelength of the issues that we want to try to address. And you know that the president-elect has talked about uh, getting the virus under control uh, and getting the country back on uh, an economic track, an economic recovery. Uh, and so that's, we will, our, our, our main focus will be, and you can do that through the Appropriations Committee is the appropriating the, uh, the resources, the money um, uh, to address the issue of of, of, the, of the testing, of the contact tracing, the treatment, and now at the center of all of this is vaccine uh, production and distribution. And that all comes through uh, the appropriations of, 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 of a committee. Uh, and then the economic side of it um, with how we are able to get people uh, back to work um, and uh, uh, providing them with the wherewithal uh, in, the, in the short term to be able to put money in their pocket for themselves and for their families. Yeah, job number one, I would assume, is going to be coronavirus relief funds and that you're going to be helping filter those out. Is that, is that correct? That's right. We will be at the, uh, the, uh, uh, the subcommittee that I now chair, Labor, Health and, and Human Services and Education, uh, has been at the center of the prior relief packages. And uh, that will be the same as true of the, of the current package coming up. What changes for Connecticut with you in this role? Does anything well, change? Access to greater resources. <laughs> and that is, mm -hmm. you know, access not just to one subcommittee, which I chair now, but there are 12 subcommittees, mm -hmm. you know, all of which will play, uh, can play some sort of a role in, in Connecticut's economy, you know, and, and, and looking at that, you know, so it is, this is the committee that deals with the, uh, the uh, spending priorities for the federal government. Anything you want people in Connecticut to know uh, in relation to your position as we close out? Last question. Well, first of all, I'm, uh, first of all, I'm honored to represent the third district of Connecticut. I now have uh, I've been honored by my colleagues to hold the position of, of the uh, chair of appropriations, uh, which is the, uh, the, the uh, by constitution, there really isn't, uh, there's no uh, issue of consequence that happens without uh, the appropriations uh, a committee. I'm in that spot, and I will do everything and anything I can to bring relief to my own state of Connecticut and to the rest of the country. All right, there you have it, part of our conversation from the past week. In other news, out of D.C., uh, we're going to talk about this coming up. The president has been unsuccessful in his efforts to overturn election results. This past week, the Supreme Court denied Pennsylvania Republicans' request to intervene, and there are still some lawsuits alive, such as one out of Texas. So we want to talk about it with Connecticut's own John Pavia. John is an adjunct law professor at Quinnipiac University. He was also a member of George W. Bush's legal team during the 2000 recount in Florida. Uh, thanks so much for doing this today. Hey, it's my pleasure. Good to be back with you. We're going to talk about the president's efforts in a moment. But first, you know, you know your way around Washington. You spent time there. I want to get your reaction to Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro's new position. Yeah, it's actually huge news for Connecticut. It's, uh, it's been a long time since we had one of our congressional delegation members in, in a position of power like this. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize what appropriations does, but it's one of the most, uh, has 
it's in the broadest jurisdiction out of all the committees in, in, in Congress, and you know, they're in charge of the money. And so when uh, a bill gets passed and money gets appropriated uh, for, for whatever, um, there's a lot of details that uh, have to be worked out after the vote is taken, the bill's passed. And, uh, you know, it's no coincidence that the states with uh, congressional uh, members in positions of power like that seem to do better when uh, the money's getting divvied up and um, it's not exactly clear who gets what um, sometimes. And uh, those states seem to do better. So, and uh, it has a lot to do with the people that you have representing the state. So it's a, it's a great feather in, uh, in her cap. And it's a, it's, it's a good thing for Connecticut to have a person, one of its own, uh, chairing one of the most powerful committees. Um, in, in uh, the House. Yeah, certainly going to be interesting to see uh, how it plays out. Connecticut does need some of that help, for sure, uh, financially. All right, so let's get back to the president right now. At this point, does the president have any recourse, in your opinion? No, no. I mean, does he have cards he can still play? Yeah, he does. But um, is, is he going to win? No, he's not. Uh, and someone asked me yesterday, what, what, what do I put his chances at? And I said, you know, uh, is it, if, if he, whatever's less than zero. So, um, but, uh, so no, lightning's not going to strike. He's not going to win. Uh, and on the 14th, when the electors uh, finally cast their ballots in the Electoral College, uh, Joe Biden's going to be the president. The Supreme Court deciding to not intervene. Uh, interesting because the president has three appointees on it, which is, you know, really incredible. His predecessors mostly were averaging around two. But are you surprised with what the Supreme Court ruled, saying that they, they weren't going to take up this filing? And is it normal for this to get to that point? Well, you know, none of this is normal. Um, but uh, was I surprised? No, not at all. Because you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the president's ask this time around of the Supreme Court as it relates to Pennsylvania was different than his one that was just before the election. The one just before the election where, where the court, I think, if they had heard the case again and Pennsylvania had turned out to be close, that issue was, um, was it right for a state court judge to extend the deadline to file mail-in ballots and absentee ballots? And he just did it. Uh, a state court judge just extended the date. Um, if that case had gone back, just that issue, I think the president would have won. But Pennsylvania was a state where he lost by, I think, 80,000 votes. So the ask this time was for the Supreme Court to decertify the entire vote. And again, uh, as we've spoken before, you need evidence. And while there is evidence of some fraud and, and uh, defects in the process in Pennsylvania and in other states, um, you need to, in this case, show massive fraud, widespread fraud, or systemic defects to, to reach that clear and convincing standard to overturn an election. And he's just not even come close to that in any of the states that he's challenged. So then that leads to the question, what is the end game at this point? Because he's continuing to push, right? So, you know, wh why? Why do it? That's yeah, a great question. And, and I, I think I said from the beginning, it's not to to win in the courts. Because back in 2000, we had a simple issue. It was a 500 vote differential. And you can overturn 500 votes pretty easy in a state like Florida or any state. And you can just find 500, 500 mistakes in, in one precinct. But that's not a big number when you're talking about 80,000. And so it, the big issue here for the president was there was no way in the amount of states that he needed to overturn, was he going to, or anybody going to be able to find enough evidence in 45 days, right, from whatever days, about 40 some, some odd days, from election day to December 14th. And you're just not going to get there. So I, th I think, and I, I thought it then, I think it now, um, the, the plan has always been to win in the court of public opinion, to try to show enough between Election Day and December 14th that there would be states, that there would be a public outcry, that there was something very, very wrong with the way the election was, was handled, that there was systemic defects and fraud. And even though there's not enough time for courts to overturn the election, have these state legislatures um, in states where the Republicans control the legislature, take the vote back and say, look, we're not going to certify our vote. Our state legislature is going to cast these electoral votes instead of letting the general, the popular vote decide where these electoral votes go. And I think that's been the end game from the very beginning. And when he brought the two legislators from Pennsylvania to the White House to try to lobby them, um, again, they said, no, it's just something we're not going to do. And he's just, he's not going to find a legislature that's going to, going to do that for him. And so uh, at this point, he should stop. But he's not going to. He's all right. He, he has his right to his day in court. But he's just not going to win. 
It's so interesting what, what your perspective is on this or what you think the end game, as I had just asked, is because I didn't realize this. So according to the Constitution, uh, if states don't certify the election results, then the legislature can cast the vote. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, I don't, yes, I, I don't want to give a, a law class on Fox 61, but I, in really short order, it's, I think, interesting for people to know that under the Constitution, state legislatures actually have the constitutional right to cast their state's ballots. That's the way it used to be done. Over the course of history, every state has, through their constitutional amendment or most likely through their statutes, passed on that, that right, although it's not the right itself, to the public to have, a, have an election and for them to decide who will who gets the electoral votes on election day. But the reality is it's called a plenary right, meaning the right that's given to the state legislatures is a, a, a absolute right. So they have the right, right, every state has technically the right to sort of pull back that right to vote back into the legislature and the legislature could cast those to decide who gets the electoral votes, which, by the way, almost happened down in Florida. We had reached a point where there was no decision by the safe harbor date. Uh, the Speaker of the House of Florida has said, you know what, we're going to cast Florida's electoral votes. Uh, they're not going to be forfeited. That is fascinating. Yeah, this has got to be hearkening back to what happened in Florida. You were on the ground there. Is there anything that you're looking at that's really reminding you of the experience uh, that you went through being on George W. Bush's team? We had a good time. It was, it was grueling. It was uh, very interesting, but it was uh, actually a great experience. Um, and, and I say that uh, even the, the, the Gore people that were down there, the, the attorneys that we had to deal with every day, um, at night we saw them all at the same restaurants and bars that we were going to and had a beer with them. Um, and we knew that we were part of something that was very rare. When I think about what's going on here, it's so different. Um, I, I will say this, uh, advocacy is important. And I think uh, there are issues with the way we're going to do elections from here on out with absentee ballots and mail-in ballots. And, you know, are there defects? Yeah, and there's defects that we need to get straightened out. I mean, could, could the president had, could have he had, had much better advocacy? I'm not saying he had bad attorneys. I just think the way they approached it, they never made a cogent argument from the very start as to why people should question the validity of, of these, these votes. They just threw out empty allegations without backing it up with anything. They had affidavits and whatnot, but... I just wasn't impressed with um, the argument, arguments they were making from day one. That argument, that doesn't that hurt democracy down the line in future Republican uh, elections? I mean, we have this runoff election in Georgia. Uh, doesn't that backfire at some point? It could backfire. It could very well backfire on Republicans. I mean, there could be people in Georgia who say, you know, I'm really not happy with the way that the party and the president handled this. I, I'll say this. I, I've heard people say, oh, this is damaging to our Constitution, to our democracy. That, I think, is, uh, is being uh, overly dramatic. Um, we've survived, uh, you know, Watergate and Bill Clinton and, you know, everything else. And I think events like this, um, it actually demonstrates how strong the Constitution is and what an amazing document it is, and I think it makes it stronger. So every time I hear, oh, my God, he's, you know, what Trump is doing is hurting democracy, hurting our Constitution, and I'm like, you know, our Constitution is going to be fine, um, and it'll be stronger. So uh, I think it may hurt his image and may probably hurt the image of, of the U.S., as we're, you know, seeing around the world, because I think it, it gets to the point of being embarrassing, uh, but it's not going to hurt our democracy or our constitution. But I do think the Republicans need to watch out um, that it leaves a bad taste in the mouth of uh, the folks down in Georgia who are going to decide, decide who, who uh, holds the Senate. Did you teach this past semester? Because your students must have had so much material to ask you about, and uh, it must have been fascinating to take your course. Yeah, I, I compared it to being a late night uh, talk show host <laughs> and having, you know, the president seemed to give these late night talk show hosts, hosts endless material every night. And it was not as much fun as being in the late night talk show host, but <laughs> you're right. It was, uh, it was a great course this semester in terms of having new material. What's, what was terrible was that it was all, mostly online. And uh, I felt bad for the students um, because, you know, it's tough to get into a groove um, even, you know, in, in, in an interview like this. Uh, it's much better when you're you're live, uh, whether it's at Quinnipiac Law School or you know sitting there at, on the desk with you at Fox 61. But this is you know it is what it is, and we'll be past this soon. But it was a great semester to be teaching this course uh, in a strange, sadistic way. You almost didn't want it to end because every week it was a 
it was another story to talk about at the beginning of class. Yeah, so true. Well, there's spring semester, so, you know, you'll have time. Uh, Professor John Pavia, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Always interesting and great to talk with you. Be well. You too. Take care. All right, coming up, the governor is getting pressure on all sides due to the pandemic. Some doctors saying close down the state, businesses, restaurants saying stay open, some saying remote learning, others saying keep our kids in school. John Dankoski, host of Steady Habits, a Connecticut Mirror podcast, helps us analyze the difficult spot leaders are in when the real story continues right after this break.